Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Um, and it's always great to be back here at Salt Baptist Church. I was uh, walking around town yesterday with Cadis. Uh, it's his first time in the UK. He's traveled to lots of countries, uh, but first time in the UK. And we were, well, we walked a long way. We walked down to Bury Park, and we walked, had a little tour of St. Mary's and all kinds of things. Uh, but he said to me at one point, oh, I can tell you really love being here by how you speak, and that's true. And I said these were great, great season of, uh, of my life and Audrey's, my wife's life, to be here at Stopsley. Uh, I'm married to Audrey. Uh, we've been married since uh, 1982, which makes it uh, a long time. I can't do the math. <laughs> 33 years. Uh, and uh, she's... Uh, and I live in Albania. Uh, we've been living there full time since September 2010. Uh, we were traveling before that uh, since 1999 in Albania quite regularly. First time Audrey went there, she said, God, I'm so glad that you haven't asked me to live here. And now she does. So there you go. So be careful what you pray. Um, We've been involved in different kinds of global mission for a long time. I, I went to Austria in, in 1980 and, and was working in Eastern Europe in the communist time. Audrey was uh, in Spain before we were married, helped plant a church there uh, in those early years uh, when it was just post-Franco, post the military dictatorship there. and uh, It was a very hostile environment to uh, Christians. They used to spray paint Yankee go home on her apartment block, so that was kind of a message that she wasn't really wanted. Um, we've uh, worked here for 11 years, as Steve mentioned, and um, now I, I have a broader role with, with Radstock Ministries. It's a church network. Our big idea is that mission should be at the center of every local church and that uh, the church ought to be at the center of mission, and so we help churches partner together for missional projects. So just in case you're a little rusty on Albania, first of all, it's down by Greece. Uh, if you think of Italy in the boot, it's just sort of behind the Adriatic Sea there, kind of at the Achilles heel of uh, Italy. Perhaps there's something to that uh, metaphor. Uh, uh, it, uh, as you probably know, it was a communist country. It was an isolated communist country. It, it broke relationships with the Soviet Union. It, it lost relationship with China. So it became a very isolated place, uh, perhaps a bit like North Korea uh, today is maybe a, uh, a fair sort of comparison. And uh, in 1967, Albania declared itself the first uh, atheist nation in, in the world. And every church was closed, every mosque was closed, every form of uh, religious activity was, was illegal. So technically illegal to pray, uh, those kinds of things. I knew some people who used to go there to pray for the nation. You hear stories of them sort of surreptitiously putting a little tract here and there and, and then having them handed back to them as they left uh, at the airport, say, oh, you forgot this, and they would be given back every tract they had handed out. Uh, I've talked to people since then who would see these foreigners come on tours, and uh, one told me our school was right beside a, a hotel where the foreigners would come. And I said, well, what, did you ever talk? And they said, oh no, they just told us, just smile and look really happy all the time whenever the foreigners are there. You know, so it was a very controlled state. 1991, two years after the end of communism in the rest of Europe, um, Albania, uh, the regime collapsed and uh, the gospel took root. There were probably four or five, is that right, Cadis? Four or five Christians at that time? Uh, older people who had lived their whole sort of adult lives from 1945 to 1991, kind of secretly, or I'll tell you a story later, it wasn't always so secret uh, for uh, God, but no church meetings, nothing like that uh, possible. I met a man once who, he said, when I was a boy, once a year, my father would take us up onto, to a, he showed me sort of this hill, this rocky hill. He said, we'd take the family up there and he would pray once a year and he said, my job was to stay at the bottom, uh, and if anybody came, I had to run up quickly and tell them so they'd stop praying because uh, they were afraid, you know. So 
So that's the environment of Albania. Today, Albania has about uh, 225 churches, 15,000 Christians, so all that's happened in a generation. So we, I hope that today that you'll hear from me, and I hope you'll hear from Cadis. I was telling Cadis, I'm going to tell everybody, don't come to my seminar, go to his, because it's going to be better. Uh, and uh, I'm really thrilled that he's here today uh, from Albania. He's a good friend of mine and a uh, fantastic Christian leader pastor, church planter, all those kinds of things. Kata said to me yesterday, what do I have to say to these people? And in a way, that's what I feel uh, talking to you today too. What do I have to say to these people? You're probably here because you're already 90% sold out to the concept. Otherwise, as someone was just saying, you wouldn't have given your Saturday to be here. So what do I have to say to you people? Well, I hope, I hope I have a word today that will encourage you. I hope I have a word today that will motivate you and give you uh, energy and, and uh, focus and perhaps maybe a slight tweaking of, of some of your thinking in, in how we live. Uh, I titled my talk, Under Attack, Under Attack. How do we live in a day when it seems like the rules have changed? It seems like uh, we're no longer as Christians, are we considered to be the good people? We're the bigots, we're the intolerant ones, we're the hateful people, uh, we're not the morally uh, we're not on the moral high ground anymore. We're the ones who are uh, looked down upon. <clears throat> the Lord's Prayer is banned. I don't know if that's really the right word, but was not allowed to be played in, in the cinemas there around Christmas time. Luton's very own EasyJet throws someone off a plane because somebody noticed his text message that had the word prayer in it. Uh, the... Uh, press seemed to go into a frenzy, didn't they, when, uh, I forget his name, but there was a new host appointed to the BBC breakfast show who's an, out, uh, an outspoken Christian, and uh, there were questions, is this person fit for purpose? Should this person be really giving us the news? Can, can this person be trusted? So things have changed, it seems to me. Even, in, you know, Audrey and I came to the UK in 1991, and it seems to me there's been a great change in that time. Uh, in, in societal views. Back then people would say, oh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm C of E, my parents were C of E, and yeah. I was baptized, and now I hear people just say, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist. So I think things have changed. We're not uh, perhaps so comfortable with that. So how do we live, how do we live in a society where we're no longer given that sort of moral uh, uh, priority or moral high ground by default? Well, every day, you know, I live with people like that in Albania. I, I fellowship with them uh, because that's, that's just the experience of Albanian Christians. So I want to share with you some of that today. So about half of 1% of Albanians are Christians, even though God's done remarkable things. Still a very small percentage of the country are believers. 70% Muslims, nominal Muslims, most of them, although that's changing. You see more and more people wearing uh, uh, more traditional Islamic dress. Although we saw more in Luton, I think, than you see in Tirana, the capital of Albania, right, Cadis, yesterday. Uh, and then 15% nominal Catholic, 15% uh, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians in Albania. So that's the environment we live in. I want to start you, start us, by looking at the scriptures and just seeing uh, what it's like to live perhaps on the margins. I don't think this is a new phenomenon for us to be thinking about. It's as old as, uh, as the gospel. So let's turn, if you can, if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. We'll just read you a few verses and uh, use these to kick off our thoughts. When I first stood up here, they had, me, they had this monitor working. I was feeling very good watching myself on television, but they've turned it off on me. So. 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 9. I'll read that for you. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. <clears throat> well, uh, Peter's writing here to uh, people, and if you uh, look back to uh, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, the English Standard Version calls them the elect exiles of the dispersion. What in the world is an elect exile of the dispersion? But he's writing to people who are scattered uh, throughout places like Pontus and Bithynia. Remember those two names? I'm going to come back to them at the end. Uh, they're scattered through Asia Minor, so roughly through modern-day Turkey. Uh, so these are believers uh, who are sort of feeling a little bit alone and living on the margins of their society. So they're the elect exiles of the dispersion. So they're scattered about, uh, they're exiles living in what seems like what is a foreign context, and they're the elect or the chosen. Well, we'll come back to that uh, a bit later, that part. Uh, and we uh, see that he uses here some Old Testament uh, language, some Old Testament imagery uh, when he talks about them. Uh, in fact, he's looking back to uh, Exodus 19, uh, which says this. Um, uh, Exodus 19, verse 4 says, uh, <clears throat> If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Peter uh, takes that language out of the Old Testament and says to, uh, to these Christians in, in uh, his modern day, uh, this is who you are. You're this kingdom of priests and this holy nation. So he says, you know, Israel, as you know, was this priestly kingdom. And... Uh, what did a priest do? Well, he made God known to the people and offered sacrifices. And Peter says, okay, Christians who are scattered all throughout Pontus and Bithynia and the rest of Asia Minor, uh, now you are this priestly group of people. You are the holy nation. So uh, God's making known to you, through you, who he is. He's calling the nations to find him, find atonement, through sacrifice, because that's what a priest does. He would make the sacrifice for the atonement of sin. So he's saying we have a corporate identity as God's people, as a holy nation, a priestly nation, a chosen people. So we're believers, we're strangers, we're scattered, we're, we're all over the place, and we're, we're a pilgrim people. Peter says in, the, in chapter 2, verse 5, I think it is, I'll just read it quickly. He says, yeah, you're being built up as a spiritual home to be a holy priesthood. Yeah, so there were these people being built into a, uh, were living stones being built together. Why? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. And so that in verse 9, again, so that we can uh, declare the excellencies of him who called us. So we're journeying onwards uh, to a future home. Uh, you can look at that in chapter 1 if you want to, this future home we have. So, do you get the picture? He's saying you're scattered, you're living in exile, you're living in a foreign context, but in fact, the true reality is you are a priestly nation, a holy nation, and God has actually chosen you. Well, chosen. Has he chosen you just to be saved? No, no. Uh, Leslie Newbegin, he writes this uh, little article called The Logic of Election, and he said, if you think about what Israel was chosen to do in the Old Testament, it was chosen to be a light to the nations. So uh, our choice is not about just the fact that we can finally have some escapism and be confident of that. No, no. The chosen part is that God has chosen us to be his light to the world, his light to the nations. So, we're chosen for this priestly nation, but we're foreigners and exiles, Peter said. Well, should we be surprised at that? Should we su be surprised that as followers of a Savior who the Bible says had nowhere to lay his head, that we feel like foreigners and exiles? Should we be surprised that we feel like we're living on the margins 
of society uh, when, again, we follow a, a savior who was a refugee as a, an infant who had, uh, again, nowhere to lay his head, lived in poverty. Should we be surprised then uh, that we don't have a better deal than he had? Well, not really, I don't think so. But we are this holy nation. So the body of Christ is an essential image, really, to understanding uh, and unpacking what it means for me to be the church and to live as a missional people. So, God's carving out a place on earth where goodness and freedom uh, can be seen, where his shalom, his peace, his justice can be seen, and that's uh, within the community of his people. So, we're elected, yes, we're chosen, but chosen to be light to the, the nations. So I want to just sort of unpack that and give you a, a whole, whole list of practical, uh, I think, practical outworkings of that concept. Do you have the concept? Living in the margins is not new. It's as old as the New Testament. Living as exiles and feeling like we're exiles and strangers is not new. It's, it's a biblical reality because, of course, we do seek a future home. But in the meantime, we're not just waiting. We're living as a priestly nation to be light to the nations. Well, first thing, let's just remind ourselves, and I'll repeat it again, life on the margins is normal for the Christian. It's normal. So we in the West, uh, you know, I think, honestly speaking, I think I, at my age, 57, if you're wondering, uh, I look way older than uh, Mike, who I was thinking last night, he's got to be getting up there. But anyway, he looks so youthful, it made me sick. Uh, uh, we in the West, and I probably lived in, was probably born into about the very easiest time ever in history. You know, the economy was booming, things were great, and as a Christian, of course, uh, I've lived free of persecution, free of uh, suffering, basically, my whole life. And that's a true story for most of us. Some of you are here from other countries, will know other realities. But probably, I think we're seeing the beginning of the end uh, for us here in Western Europe. Now, I know it's propaganda, I know it's, uh, it's all kinds of uh, things you can say about this, but I saw recently a map that ISIS uh, had made of Europe in 2050, and it had in black all the countries that they plan to control by 2050. Has anybody seen this? We went around the internet a little bit. Uh, so all of the Balkans, all where Cadiz and I live, Albania, Serbia, Kosovo, Bosnia, uh, and so on, Spain, okay, you can maybe ex expect that with the history of uh, Islam in Spain. And where else? The UK, the UK. So there was this black blotches all over Europe, and that's the ISIS plan uh, for 2050. Uh, will it happen? Only God knows that. I was talking with uh, a missionary from Pakistan, who's I think here somewhere, a few years ago, and she said, uh, Brian, you know, the suffering is probably going to come, and of course, it's not going to be very pleasant, but it's going to be very good for us as a church. It's going to be very good. Interesting perspective for uh, us to have from someone who's lived amongst Christians who suffer every single day. A colleague of mine in Radstock, Anthony Adams, uh, does some work in, in uh, Pakistan, and he's, he's, he's uh, trying to help develop some missional initiatives there. And uh, a year or two ago, he was with a group of Pakistani evangelists, six or eight men who uh, worked to preach the gospel, start churches in you know very difficult situation, as we all know. <clears throat> and he sat there and he realized uh, when he was in this meeting with these guys, uh, they all had scars on their bodies. And he said to these guys, what happened? Did you have an accident? Oh, no, that's from preaching the gospel, they said. When I was preaching, I got attacked. That's a scar. You know, he, he said, I don't have any scars. So life on the margins is normal for so many people uh, to live in. We have been perhaps in a cocoon from that uh, over our lifetime. So we probably need to get ready for the fact that will change in our lifetime or our children's lifetime, depending on our age. My friend Fisnik in Bosnia, an Albanian church planter who's left Albania, uh, he, he got on the bus about seven or eight years ago now and went to Kosovo to do a three-year uh, sort of apprenticeship in church planting 
took his wife and his two kids at the time, got on a bus, they didn't have a car, they carried all their stuff in a couple of suitcases, and uh, they had 180 euros in their pocket. That was it, they had no guarantee of support. 180 euros, God's called us, off we go, you know, and uh, they're still going sort of uh, seven or eight years later now in Bosnia, which is where they knew they were called to even at the time. You know, and I said to him not long ago, how's it going? And he said, oh, you know, uh, about a third of the time people say to me when I share the gospel, he's in a Muslim city with not one, well, one very elderly believer who's an ethnic minority person, uh, not a Bosnian. Uh, he said, about a third of the time when I share the gospel, people say, I hate that message and therefore I hate you. Wow. That's living on the margins. I hate that message, therefore I hate you. So Peter's response uh, to all of that is, you know, it, it's part of the journey of faith. He says in, in chapter 1, uh, verse 7, uh, and 6 and 7, he says, uh, You should greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, it's, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So is suffering a bad thing? Well, no, because it proves our faith, it tests our faith, it's part of the normal Christian life, and it results in praise and glory and honor to Jesus Christ, which is not a bad thing. Okay, I need to move on, keep going. I'm Got a lot of things I'd like to share with you. Second thing, uh, first thing, life on the margins is normal. Second thing, God often works in the midst of oppression. Just yesterday I heard that in Finland there are hundreds, hundreds of Arabs turning to Christ, people who fled the Middle East. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Muslims turning to Christ. Uh, you know, that probably wouldn't have happened uh, except uh, in this turmoil. And you hear these stories coming out of the Middle East all the time. Converts, converts, converts to Christ. It doesn't get much news, but it's happening. So God works in the midst of oppression. Cadiz was telling me yesterday, we were talking, and he said, you know, the, the tragedy or the sad thing about Albania was in the 1990s, just after the end of communism, uh, you know, when there was a, a huge sort of vacuum of values and the economy completely collapsed. I know many people were struggling even to have food in those days. He said the harvest was so big, it was so big we didn't have enough workers uh, to bring it in. It's too bad even more missionaries didn't come just to, to harvest. You know, in that political turmoil, God often works. One thing I love about being in Albania is I, I, I'm with a whole group of people in the churches and for them, the idea that God will change a nation in a short time is not strange. Well, why is it not strange? Because they've lived it. They've seen it. It happened. Uh, and so they have that confidence. You know, do we believe that God can change this nation in a short time? In a generation, do we believe? In 25 years, do we believe that uh, we could have 3,000 more times more believers? Not 3,000 more, but 3,000 times more believers. Uh, than we have today in the UK, like has happened in Albania in 25 years. God can do these things. God can do these things. And I want to encourage you with that. Third thing, uh, all mission is local. All mission is local. We talk about global, sorry Steve, I really hate the word, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but I get what you're saying and I love the concept. Uh, so we talk about this global, local tension or continuum you know, I say sometimes, all mission is local. I happen to do local mission in Albania where I live. Uh, you get the privilege of doing local mission here in Luton where you live. I used to do local mission in Luton when I lived here. All mission is local. So let's uh, just equip ourselves and say wherever we are today, wherever God's put us, that's the place he wants us to go. My friend Genny and Cadis' friend Genny, he told me, you know, in those early days that I was just mentioning when this harvest was so plentiful, he'd say, Brian, he said, you know, we had no money. We really had no money. And, he's, and I, I said, no money? He said, yeah, I mean no money. Uh, and he said, you know, we had dirty clothes. We had holes in our clothes. We were just poor. And he said, we'd get together as believers and we'd say, let's go to Pogradets. Let's go to Shkodra today and preach the gospel. And he said, so we'd call people, find somebody who was going there, hitch a ride, borrow money to take a bus, do anything. 
and we'd go and we'd preach the gospel. We didn't have food. We'd sort of have to just rely on some local person giving us food. We didn't have a place to sleep. We'd have to rely on Albanian hospitality to sleep. But he said, we just decided we had to go and just to speak. Uh, my friend Ogi in Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia is a country like Albania, very closed, no churches really until 1991, same year. Three million people like Albania to 1991. Today, probably 120, 150,000 Christians there from zero in uh, 1991, and, uh, and probably 500 churches. So the gospel spread even much quicker than, um, than in Albania. And I said to Ogi, how did this happen? He said, we're a nomadic culture. We don't mind moving uh, to share the gospel. And uh, I've seen some of those nomads when I visited Mongolia, and there they are in their, in their gares, their yurts, their, their tents with their sheep, sheep inside. It doesn't smell nice in those tents, let me tell you. Uh, and you know, they just move, and wherever they are, that's their home. And so for them, all farming is local. We go, we find the grass, and we set up shop. You know, can we think about mission that way, that wherever we are, wherever God puts us, if he puts us at work in the morning, if he puts us uh, with our neighbors in the afternoon, all mission is local. We go to people, we enter their world, we make camp among them. You know, there's this concept of, uh, should we be, as a church, should we be centrifugal or centripetal? Should we be a church that uh, is centripetal and sucking people in, or should we be centrifugal and sending out? And I guess the answer is probably a bit of both, because we are a community of people that is a light to the nations, but yet God calls us, doesn't he, to move out. A guy named Timothy Keller in New York City, who started a lot of churches there, he talks about a tipping point, and he says this, he says, when five to 20% of the people in any kind of uh, community are believers and they're actively engaged speaking for their faith involved in what's going on it tips the culture so he said in a new york city neighborhood if five percent of the believers or five percent of the people are christians are committed uh, christians it changes the culture of the neighborhood in a prison he said if 10 percent of the inmates become christians the prison wardens report it changes completely the culture of the prison. And so he says, whether it's the board of the local art museum, whether it's uh, the town hall, whatever it is, he said, if you get five to 15 or 20% of the people there are committed believers and uh, actively living out their faith, it changes the culture. All missions local. See, where we are when we get together, we can have that transforming effect. So I want to encourage you today, wherever you are, you know, start to build that nucleus around you of other believers and pray for God to give you that 5 to 15%. Fourth thing, our new identity is uh, not notional. It's not just an idea. It's really a change in who we are as God's people. Uh, one of the elders in our church in, in Albania says, you know, this is my family. I have a great family. I love my family. And he does love his family. But he said, actually, when it comes to being close, this is my family. And so when you go to an Albanian church, uh, if, a, if a person walks in off the street and nobody knows them, uh, everybody's talking to them, saying, who are you, welcome, how are you, you know, what's going on? It's not perhaps very English, but uh, it might be a good thing to try to do, you know, it's just because it's just a common idea that uh, you're a person, you're human, and we're an open, welcoming community. So relationships are not a project. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an evangelistic idea. I need to go make some friends so I can uh, evangelize them. No, in Albania, the culture says, we'll just make friends because that's who we are. We want to make friends. And of course, when you're a friend, the gospel gets shared. Gregor, who's actually spoken here in this church a few years ago, uh, many years ago now, an Albanian church planter working in Kosovo and working in Macedonia now in a city with uh, not one believer, Muslim city, not one believer. He says this, uh, he said, you know, when you are working uh, amongst these people who you're trying to share the gospel with, he said this, uh, when they have a problem, you drop everything and you go serve them. He said, they need to understand that they're your friend and they're not your project. 
So he said, you treat them just like you would your family because that's what has to be conveyed. So our new identity as family has to mean something. Uh, in uh, also Macedonia, in, in a place called Ghost of Ar, where there's some uh, a history from this church working in mission, uh, there's been a team there now for seven years. First person just came to Christ. First Muslim convert just came to Christ, a guy named Haji. He's 70 years old. You know, now, if I were God, I would have picked a young, educated, 25-year-old man with a future. But God chose a 70-year-old man who lives in a wooden hut. He has no electricity and no water. Uh, he's poor. And he's the very first convert to Islam. I say to myself, how is God going to build a church? Or how is that team going to build a church around this guy who, humanly speaking, won't be around that long? Uh, well, here's an interesting thing that's happening. You know, he's been living in poverty and he's really, you know, he was really uh, uh, just a broken person. Every Saturday, Shkelzen, the Albanian team leader, he says to Haji, come over, come over to our, uh, our language center and he washes him. He washes him. They cut his toenails. They said, oh, you know, Brian, they said that was a difficult thing. You know, his toes hadn't been cared for for who knows how many years. He washes them every Saturday. And these other people in this town, their friends are saying, what are you doing? Why do you, why do you, look at that guy's filthy. Why do you care for this guy? Well, the answer is simple because now he's family. He's a brother. He's in the body of Christ. We love him. We accept him. And guess what? That's been a powerful testimony to those people. So what's God's wisdom in seeing an old, dirty man come to Christ? Well, you see the body of Christ in action. So our new identity is not some notional thing. It works out in practice. Tim Chester up in New Yorkshire says this, it's not simply that ordinary Christians live good lives that enable them to invite friends to evangelistic events. Our lives are the evangelistic events. Our life together is the apologetic for the good news. So the local church is the model of God's new community. It's where God's peace and justice and love and uh, his reign dwells. It's this tangible earthly manifestation of the wisdom of God. Really quickly, standing behind the parapet uh, and thinking about survival creates a distorted church. I worked in Eastern Europe in the communist times and I met some people who are my heroes, were my heroes, many of them have gone to be with the Lord, but they were so pressured, so under uh, the pressure every day, they developed a mentality, we're just gonna withdraw from society and just try to survive, just try to survive. And then freedom came, and you know what? They had no idea what to do. They had no idea what to do. Uh, standing behind the parapet is not the answer for us. Uh, that's a, a lesson I've seen with my own eyes. Uh, the rest of the world won't see that evangelistic event of our lives if we decide we're just going to withdraw amidst this cultural pressure that we may be feeling. Uh, next point, you know, Christian values really do stand against our culture. Don't they? Why was the Lord's Prayer banned? Well, the Bishop of Sheffield had some good thoughts on that. He said, you know, because it opposes the gods of our day. Our Father who art in heaven, yeah, there's more than, to life than this one. He said, no advertiser wants that message to get across. Hallowed be thy name, we reject the idols of our time. Does any advertiser want that to get across? No. So they don't want the Lord's Prayer being shown and then the advert for the car or the holiday or the clothes or whatever else. <laughs> thy kingdom come. There's a higher ruler than the gods of our time. Whatever your values are, there's a higher ruler than the ones of our society. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We care about justice. We care about oppression. We care about hunger. We care about disease. We care, care about death in the whole earth here in Luton and beyond. Give us this day our daily bread. We will choose contentment over accumulation, over greed, over striving. Uh, that's who we are. All these things are opposing the gods and the values of our day. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Hey, I'm not number one. There's more to life than me having power and authority if I humble myself. Uh, that's the key to good relationship and whole relationship. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Life is messy, life is ugly, and life is difficult uh, oftentimes, but God is good, and his light guides us to what is good. So we live as subversive people on the margins of a culture which stands against us. Why? Because thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. We're all about the glory of God. You know, 50 years after Peter wrote this letter, a guy named Pliny, the younger, was governor of Pontus and Bithynia. Remember I told you? Remember those names? And he wrote to the Roman emperor because he was disturbed by all the Christians that he had to deal with. And uh, they were refusing to bow down and worship the emperor. And uh, the test was simple. You had to invoke the Roman god and worship him. You had to offer prayer with incense and wine to the emperor's image. And you had to curse Christ. And Pliny said, none of which those who are really Christians will uh, be willing to do. So he said, those who persisted in refusing, he said, I executed them because such stubbornness has to be punished. That's one way of looking at things. Uh, so here's what he wrote, though, to the governor. Remember, this is the same place that Peter wrote just 50 years later uh, to these scattered few exiles. Pliny says this, many persons of every age, every rank, and also both sexes uh, will be endangered by this religion for the contagion of this superstition, that's faith in Jesus, has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and the farms. He's saying, my whole region of Pontus and Bithynia, it's being overrun by these people. Well, 50 years ago, they were scattered exiles. Can God change a nation in a generation or in two generations in 50 years? Yeah, he can. He's been doing it forever. He did it in the first century. He did it in the 20th century in Albania. And uh, we have every reason, therefore, to believe he will do it and can do it in the 21st century in Europe, despite some of the signs we may see that uh, perhaps concern us. So, elect exiles of the dispersion, chosen by God to be light to the nations. Can we thrive on the margins? Absolutely. Can we live as exiles and see Christ glorified? Absolutely. Uh, will there be a risk? Absolutely. There's an old man in our church, one of these ones who was a believer before communism, stayed faithful to God all the time during communism. Uh, and uh, I, I, he's, he's very old, so I, I sat him down one day and I, I just read a, a recording and just got him talking. Tell me about your life. Tell me about uh, what it was like. And, uh, you know, he said, oh, my wife was such an evangelist. She was always sharing the gospel at work. He said, it got us into so much trouble. And I said, yeah, I can imagine it got you into trouble uh, because people would tell stories about how they'd get into trouble for having too many light bulbs going and things. So I said, what happened? He said, well, they called me in. You know, I'm the man. It's Albania. You talk to the man. And they called me in and they said, you've got to stop, stop your wife from talking about this religious stuff, you know. And he said, uh, I only knew one thing. He said, I only knew that uh, more than religion, the Albanian authorities hated divorce because they wanted us to raise good socialist families. So he said, I told them, you know women, you can't shut them up. He said, I have to divorce her. It's my only option. And they said, no, no, don't divorce. He said, okay. Then she's going to keep talking. And she did. We had to be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves in our day, and we had to be courageous, don't we? That took some courage. He could have lost, you know, his life for that uh, because people were sometimes killed for being uh, out of line. So let's be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves. You know, I used to pray for Albania. I'd go to prayer meetings when it was in the communist time. And uh, we pray for God to move. We pray for it to open up to the gospel and all these things. And, you know, the honest truth is I didn't really believe I'd ever see the answer to those prayers. But, you know, I was a missionary, so you had to go to that prayer meeting. Uh, but God did change it. A nation was transformed from zero churches to 225 and counting today. Cadus maybe will tell you he's really initiated a whole church planting uh, initiative from four to five Christians to 15,000 today, so 3,000 times more believers than back then. 
Uh, Albanian brothers and sisters have seen it, and uh, so my word from them to us today is, let's trust God to do similar things. It's not from our power, but it's from our weakness. It's not from uh, us being in the center, but it's being from us on the margins. It's not from our comfort, but it's being uh, coming from our sacrifice, where we say, we have no money, we have holes in our clothes, we have no food today, but let's go preach the gospel if that's what it takes. And it's through faithful proclamation of the excellencies of him who's called us to be a priestly nation. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you've called us to be a people who are, through our life together, a proclamation of the good news. We thank you, Lord, that you've sent us, and Lord, also that the beauty of community draws people at the same time. We thank you that there's a going out and a coming in from a healthy Christian community. And Lord, I uh, continue to pray, Lord, for this church and the other churches here, Lord, that you will raise up more and more of those kinds of communities, people centered on the glory of Christ, the excellencies of him who's called us, proclaiming those things with our words, living those things with our lives so that people both hear and see the goodness that is you. In Jesus' name.